And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to Financial Fitness Friday. I'm Rich Rosso, CFP, here with Danny Ratliff, Certified Financial Planners Squared. We welcome you this morning. Thanks for being here. My thought is if uh, we get this electric electric car mandate in, that uh, Danny would probably have to charge twice before he gets here in the morning. Assuming if I can charge at all, if everybody's charging at the same time. Oh, you mean the you mean the infrastructure? Sure. I thought we had a bill for that. No. Yeah, you get a bill for everything. <laughs> yeah, Check your mailbox. You get a bill. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Uh, well, futures uh, actually they were negative before J.P. Morgan posted record revenues that topped expectations. Uh, I think Wells Fargo. So a lot of the big, bigger, the biggies are going to report today on the bank side. <clears throat> and so far, the news has been positive for banks. So Dow futures are up, uh, I think, uh, 49 points. Uh, S&P is sort of down, f- sort of flat. So that was better than just a few minutes ago. So uh, PNC reported, looks like all the all the banks that are reporting are up anywhere from 3 to 5% or a little bit more than that. Yeah, it, this is something that I think that everybody's watching kind of a, a, you know on pins and needles to see yep. exactly what happens here with the banks. I mean, obviously, the big guys are likely to get bigger and stronger because they have that too-big-to-fail moniker associated with them. And I think that we're still going to see that these smaller regional banks could potentially struggle. You know, yeah. we're hearing more and more talks of, uh, you know, potentially be people being downgraded. And I don't think it's just banks, it's corporations as well, which is going to limit their access to capital. And so I think that's going to be something that, you know, as this continues to to move through the markets and the economy, these higher interest rates, and as we continue to see regulators and, um, you know, these rating agencies make changes, this could become a bigger issue over time. Now, this is positive news at the moment. You know, the headline is J.P. Morgan beats on higher interest rates. Great. But unfortunately for you and I, if you have money at the bank, that doesn't mean that you're actually getting paid more. That's how they're they're doing well. <laughs> they don't want to pay you anything. Well, but there are banks that will. And so this is what, you know, conversations that we have on a regular basis is, you know, use these big banks for your, your checking account, for your credit card, for things that you do on a regular basis, your day-to-day activities, but find the places that are going to give you and, and pay you to patronize them. That's why I use uh, an online bank checking account. I don't have any brick and mortar bank exposure. I haven't for 10 years and it's been fine. But to your point, Danny, I agree with you. Um, Banks don't want to pay. They don't have to pay. And uh, that's why over the last how many years now have we promoted uh, using FDIC insured online banks like Synchrony or Ally or Marcus because uh, and again, we were on that bandwagon, I think, again, before anybody else. Yeah, talking about how you're still going to get even in a lower interest rate environment, you're going to get better rates, and they will increase rates for you uh, on your online bank. Yeah, I think the important thing is to make sure that you stay under those FDIC li- limits, especially in this environment <clears throat> where you know there is Always. potential. Janet Yellen, you know, comes out and says, "Hey, there's going to be banks that are going to fail. We're going to we're going to save some. We're going to we're going to not save others." So I never said that, Janet. Uh, I said we're going to take care of all of you. I walked except, right into that one, didn't I, Brent? Except your bank's in Midland. I know better. If you're in Midland, Texas, you're going under. <laughs> like my husband and that housekeeper in the pool. You're going under. Oh, man. Well, there's a visual for you this <laughs> early in the morning. <laughs> I prefer you, not to go there. This was your fault. You stepped right into it. I did. I did. I but she did guys. say, she said, then she, then uh, again, Powell comes out and it's a total contradiction. So these two need to maybe spend some time together. Well, it's interesting because Powell will come out and say one thing. That's exactly right. And then she'll come out and say something different. It's like, do you guys even communicate? She's a loaded pistol. I mean, what happened here where, um, you know, are these just gaffes where, <laughs> oh, wait, I misremembered or. If there's ever a silver alert that Janet Yellen is missing, 
I'm not looking for. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that. <clears throat> How dare you say that? So, yeah, I'm saying it, Janet. I'm not looking for you. So, you know, this is a big conundrum for a small business, Danny. This is where the pressure is. One, my lending standards, my ability to borrow is definitely going to be tougher. Plus, I'm going to pay higher interest rates. Yep. And yet, the labor market remains remarkably strong, right? So we got all these funky numbers uh, post-pandemic. So, yes, we've seen, uh, we've, we've seen certain fall in uh, different, you know, different rates uh, when it comes to employment. We've seen uh, job postings come down, I think, about 17% or so. But, man... Leisure, hospitality, education, health, government. The, the, you know, these smaller businesses, especially in hospitality, and a lot of small businesses, I don't know how they're going to afford to let workers go. They're going to find, because how are they going to replace them? So they're going to have to keep those wages sustained. If you look at the sticky price CPI uh, from the Atlanta Fed, that has not budged. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> inflation is headed in the right direction. But we're nowhere close to that 2% benchmark. We're not. We're not. So what we have to keep in mind is even though the Fed might have one more rate hike in them, a majority of rate hikes have not been felt yet. And in addition, this whole talk, Danny, unless there's some sort of crisis, <clears throat> this whole talk of a pivot by the summer or rates going in the opposite direction, that just doesn't seem to make sense to me. When, it, when you look at the six sticky price uh, CPI, and in some cases they're thinking that uh, manufacturing inf uh, inflation or goods inflation is going to increase. And I will tell you, with some of these new initiatives by the, f by the executive branch, you're going to have higher prices. You're going to have higher supply costs when it comes just to our energy policy and the overall, uh, the overall clean green dream that certain parties have been seduced by so that leads to higher costs long term so i don't know if it was brainerd but i can't remember who said it but once even inflation starts to ebb and they stop the rate hikes they're not going to go backwards for for maybe a couple of years well, I think the Fed has an in interesting position right now. I mean, they've done a lot of rate hikes. This is probably the fastest rate hiking, you know, we'll call it an expedition that mm -hmm. they've been on, where they got really behind the curve and they had to they had to hike aggressively. And the issue with that is that it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to see the impact of this. Now, granted, we've seen this with the banks already, at least regional, smaller banks. Um, we're seeing this, you know, kind of pop up in other areas as well. And I think, you know, what you mentioned earlier, the access to capital is going to be much more difficult. So as a small mm -hmm. business, how do you plan? I, right. You're not yeah. able to let people go. Right. But yet maybe you're not as inclined to take on debt, which is many times needed just for growth. Yeah. So, I mean, let's put it. You're going to have to have some you're going to have some resilient, creative business owners over the next couple of years. Going to have to be as long as there are people coming in the door. So we get back, we're going to talk about Social Security. We did a Social Security lunch and learn yesterday. We're going to talk about the security or insecurity. How secure is Social Security? How many times can I say secure? Nobody knows. <laughs> we'll see you on the other side of the break. Daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Retirement's not what it used to be, and knowing how health insurance works after you leave your job is vital. Our next Lunch and Learn will tackle transitioning to Medicare. Thursday, May 11th, with Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso. How will Medicare work with the insurance you already have? What are the deadlines you need to know for signing up for Medicare? Register now for our Transitioning to Medicare Lunch and Learn 
learn with Ratliff and Rosso at realinvestmentadvice.com. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. And now another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So Lawrence McDonald, pretty good uh, sort of macro guy on Twitter. Uh, he writes, Dear Mr. Powell, close to $11 trillion in U.S. Treasury bonds maturing in the next 24 months need to be refinanced. So the current funding rate is 1.6 to 1.9%. The new funding rate will be anywhere from 3.4 to 4.6. So interest as a percent of the budget explodes from 8% to nearly 17% as a very conservative estimate. So I understand Social Security and health entitlements make up the bulk of the budget, but oh boy, wait till we see what net interest is going to look like. Well, and it's not just for them. Obviously, Treasury Department, I mean, this is, this is a big deal as far as what that, those interest payments are. Yeah. But if you go and look at global corporate bonds, there is a ton <laughs> maturing. It's almost the same number. I think it's 11 trillion maturing between 23 and 26. Yeah. And a lot of them high yield are high, high yield. yield. And That's right. They're going to be in big trouble. You can see a lot of companies go under. Matter of fact, just watch the, the business in your local area. Like, for example, here in Houston, a huge apartment complex consortium that they, you know, you can invest in these groups. Yeah. Multifamily. For passive income has gone under. Uh, I can't remember how many units. 3,200? Some massive. Wow. Timber Ridge Apartments and some others. <clears throat> this is going to be the time. The cracks are going to be exposed and the businesses that should go out will go out because the Fed's going to be stuck and they're not going to be able to lower rates. Now, what Larry McDonald's talking about, maybe you'll see lower rates, um, but even say at 3.4 to 4.6%, you're going to, you're going to explode the, 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 deficit, the budget to nearly 17%. And I don't know, I think his numbers might be me low. I think just think that we're in for these higher rates for longer, and it's going to be tough for the Fed to break it, but at the same time, they're going to maybe halt their, their rate hikes. And again, I think this market is really set, Danny, for a pivot in July and August. That seems to be the narrative, but I, I just, I mean, I don't know. I don't see it when I look at sticky price CPI and I, and I see where prices are and we talk to so many small business owners, people on the front lines with labor costs. Yeah. Wage growth is not keeping up with inflation, but you're still going to try to retain your workers just based on the labor force participation rate. So like you said, you know, big business, Danny and I mentioned this before, this is going to be a white collar recession. If you're in Home Depot's corporate office behind a cubicle, you may be gone. If you're working in the garden department, you're probably fine. Matter of fact, you're probably getting another raise. Because yeah, they want to keep you. Yeah, because they're going to keep you. Because even if business slows down, 
if they remove you, then they got to rehire you and you may not want to be. So this is the dilemma for this next this next cycle that we're going into. And that's why I don't envy. <clears throat> I mean, we're a small business and, you know, we want to pay our people well. And I think we do a good job with that compared to industry standards. Um, and but we want to keep our people. We lose a person here. It, it's a big deal. We have yeah. so many great, great people on the front lines that work for us every day, and we try to appreciate them as best we can. But we think about if we lose some of them, those create big holes in your business. And a lot of small to mid-sized businesses have to feel that way. So no matter what, we're going to try to find a way to keep our people. <clears throat> and we don't want to go out there and take on debt to do it based on where interest rates are. So that's going to be interesting. So when it comes to Social Security... Obviously, there's a lot of talk about the OASDI trustees report uh, and the financial projections for Social Security program over the next 75 years. And again, nothing unexpected. Um, but Danny, we talked about this yesterday on the Lunch and Learn about how funding can be curtailed depending upon 2034, 2035, and that there just may be minor fixes that need to be done. Right. Uh, 2023 is the exhaust date. Um, so that's when the OAS fund is expected to run out in 2033. But the DI fund is, is expected to uh, maybe go out a little bit later. And then you would get about 80 percent of the benefit. Yeah, and but, I think I think the media headlines are, are are always each and every year we get new information on this. They, they update it. Congressional Budget Office. Yeah. Um, you know, all the other organizations that are looking at this and trying to decipher how bad is it or where are we right and it, it's been pushed back you know initially a couple of years ago it was 2028 2029 then it went all the way to 2032 now it's 33 34 depending on which source you look at you know we even saw last year is 35 but and, and so 2035 meaning that that's when you would see a reduction in benefits and regardless of of the exact date i think the important thing to know is that number one yes there is a problem yeah number two Yes, we do believe it'll still be here, uh, but to what extent? Um, I don't envision some huge cut, and, and I don't think you do either, just because people can't afford a huge cut. I mean, imagine this. You make you know, $2,000 a month in Social Security benefits. We're just going to use it for easy math. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you get a $400 cut. What's your impact to your, your bottom line, to your household? Can you pay your bills? Because we know the numbers behind it on how many people rely on it for a big, big portion of their overall retirement income. I yeah. mean, this was supposed to be a subsidy just to help subsidize income as you moved from uh, working and being an accumulator to now becoming a distributor. Right. The problem is, is that now this is, this is a whole enchilada for many people, it right? Is. You've got half of the people who are retired right now rely on it for more than half the retirement income. You, you see what happened in France? Yeah. We're oh, going yeah. French if that happens. Mm. Oh, you know it. Yep. Brett yeah. will be out there with his walker. French with, toast. He's going to have his walker out, and then he's gonna, it's going to be like um, Mad Max because <laughs> Brent's going to make the ends of his walker have, like, they're going to be shaved down Still to, like, those. spears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going to be terrifying. <laughs> Now, I, I think the one good thing that's that's coming out of France right now yeah. is this. Fries? Right? In the sense, no, Cruisons? of course, fries. Okay. Uh, no, but this, I think, is is, is a, a good thing because you have to think that congressmen, oh, they're women, crying senators. Like little girls. They're crying like little girls because the retirement age was raised a little bit. Well, no, but but I, I but listen, this is drastic, right? I mean, you go a couple of years. Oh, gosh. This is a game changer. No, no, no. It's because, look, drastic. everybody, what do most people say? When do they want to retire? What's the age? Well, 65 is the magical age. But when do most people retire? 62. Yep. And we know what people have in savings accounts. Yeah. On average. Yeah. We know what people have in retirement accounts on average. And then we look at the median, it's even worse. So if you think you're going to retire at 65, but you actually retire at 62, and now you can't rely on any type of additional supplemental income, people are in trouble. Right, so now you've really burned through it mm -hmm. over those years because people are retiring early, and that's when they retire at sixty-two. It's not because they want to; it's because they have to. 
right? They, they're out of the or, workforce. Or they happens. feel like I'm getting to get Social Security, so I will retire sooner. But to your point, I think a lot of there are people that are involved in physical labor that just can't go to a certain point, right? They it's true. They need to to look at that, even though when it comes to raising the retirement age, which would help the system. Um, you know, there's talk about raising the full retirement age to 70, and I don't think you can do that I, for, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Um, I think you can go ahead and raise it to 68 for people born 70, 1974 and later. I think you could do that. So under the worst case scenario, say 2034 arrives, there's no money in the trust fund, then payroll taxes are sufficient to pay about 80% of scheduled benefits. And that's an across the board cut of 20%, right? Um that would put benefits of actually about where they are today. So what you're referring to is actually the revenue driven from the tax dollars, right? Right, payroll so, tax. So while the, the trust fund is depleted, there's still money coming in. And I think this is a big misconception that they say, oh my gosh, everything's gone. But there's still money coming in. And we are running a deficit, which is why we're going to run into an issue but here's further the issue, down the line. Danny, here's the issue that I think about even for payroll tax. And again, I'm a big believer in Social Security only because Danny and I see the impact of people to help on their lives. Um, what if our demographics continue in this where they've been where and we see labor force participation rate where people don't want to work and there and there aren't as many payroll taxes right yeah. we're assuming that america stays america and people actually want to work and they're going to pay into the system i mean look what's happened over the last two three years what's going to happen over the next 10 12. so there's this assumption that we're going to have payroll tax and we're going to have a healthy labor force participation rate. And maybe that's the case, but I don't know. Well, I, th I think there is to some extent, right? Look, we're coming out of pandemic. You have the, the YOLO mentality. You only live once. And people had to change, right? They had to pivot in their jobs and what they were doing. People were, you know what? I'm going to go out and start that small business or I'm going to become yes, this we've seen or a that. spike in business, uh, Creation, but, well, sure. you have, but yeah. I think at, at some point you're going to see people kind of turn back to traditional jobs again. And, and maybe you don't. Maybe you still have, you know, these small businesses, which are great. I love small no, businesses because they about, create But think the about the, the culture and the mentality. It really depends on, like, your kids, like, what they're, you know, the, the, next, the next G. I can't remember what the generation is after Z. Uh, there's, a, there's a name for it. Um, but there's that. <laughs> the Y generation. Why are you here? Um, plus, we're not having enough children. So it also depends on immigration and, and all these. I mean, That's so the many, kicker, immigration. So, yeah, so many factors. Well, not maybe the immigration we're going through, <laughs> going through now, but some form. I mean, there's it's just going to gonna have to be a lot to, to build that up because the whole world is in a malaise economically and when it comes to debt as... Lawrence McDonald wrote just for the U.S., but that's not just the U.S. that has a debt problem. Oh, and, and there's not just the U.S. has a demographic problem, and our demographic problem is not as significant as many other countries. Correct. China. Look at China, right? China, Russia. I, mean, yep. I think the only one that does not have a significant demographic issues, India. Why do I want to have a baby in Russia? Look at that beautiful burnt-out building. We'll be right back. Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Yeah. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Retirement's not what it used to be. And knowing how health insurance works after you leave your job is vital. Our next Lunch and Learn will tackle transitioning to Medicare. Thursday, May 11th with Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso. How will Medicare work with the insurance you already have? What are the deadlines you need to know for signing up for Medicare? Register now for our transitioning to Medicare Lunch and Learn with Ratliff and Rosso at realinvestmentadvice.com. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. 
Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. I'll put like a $100 bill in my wallet just because, again, you know, you break down on the side of the road, something like that. I just, I'm old, right? So I'm a boomer. I just feel like I have have more security if I have a little bit of cash in my wallet just in case. The Real Investment Show podcast. But as soon as I have cash in my wallet, my kids invariably ask me for money. I don't know how they know I have cash in my wallet, but they have a, a direct link mentally to my wallet. At realinvestmentadvice.com. My kids are psychic. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved before the bell report, candid coffee and lunch and learn replays. Plus each day's radio show subscribe and bookmark our youtube channel or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com you're listening to the real investment show i'm just glad this mic is not during the uh, commercials <clears throat> outtakes <laughs> yeah Hey, don't. Okay. I, okay. <laughs> don't go there. I'm not. I'm not going anywhere. That's where I'd be going. You wouldn't be hearing from me next week. You'd be coming to my funeral. So young generations tend to think Social Security won't be there for them. And I guess boomers thought that too. Um, I don't know. I, I think it will be there. I think, though, as a Gen Z... Um, you need to understand that, first of all, Gen Z is a little bit more risk averse. The major part of the, the, the majority of them are. Um, they they're, they actually have, tend to be good savers. They also don't like to take on a lot of risk. So if you're planning for someone in their 20s, it might be a really good idea, Danny, to look at their Social Security estimate and say, okay, Maybe I have half the benefit. Let's just make this assumption. I'm going to have 50 to 70% of the benefit. I am going to need to, as a Gen Z, ironically, look to away from the stock market. Let me explain. I might need to want to fulfill or fill that half-empty Social Security bucket with a guaranteed income from the private sector. I might have to build my own pension depending on what life expectancy is going to look like for a Gen Z, which sounds totally counter to what most advisors would tell a Gen Z. Oh, you're young. You're so young. Put everything in the stock market because stocks are the answer to everything. Okay, 
That's for a portion of it, and they have the time. But why not, Danny, help Gen Z understand that uh, the, the Social Security situation and that if they want to retire sooner than, say, where full retirement age might be for them, say, 68 or 69, maybe help them look at guaranteed income and embrace that earlier to build their own pension. What do you think of that? Yeah, I'm not opposed to that. I think that's a great idea for anybody to understand, you know, what the different types of income you may need. The problem is, is that envisioning and going that far out in the future is difficult for most, right? Mm -hmm. If you, you talk to a younger person about, you know, plans, goals, objectives, what they want to do, and almost every time, hey, I mm -hmm. want to retire at 50, 55, here's how much I make, here's how much I'm putting aside, here's how much, I oh, wait, I don't know how much I want to spend, right? And that's the problem. And so when you're trying to back into numbers, it's a little bit easier as you age because you start to get a, you, you understand what you're spending, what your habits will be, what debt you may or may not have, where I think that for a younger person, it's difficult. While I'm not opposed to it. Um, yeah. And to your point, maybe they're not, maybe you're prepping them. Correct. Right. You're saying that you might need to look at this and then maybe like there's a phase, say in your early thirties, mid thirties, you start looking at when, like you said, you're a little bit more practical. Maybe you have a child. Maybe you understand you're more mature to, to comprehend the fact that it would be nice to have a check for life. Yeah. But I think introducing it into the conversation and working it around that we, you might have to fulfill your own shortfall might be something that you do need to do. And that could also be for Gen X and millennials um, as well. So... You know, 80% of our benefits better than nothing. And people think that if they take it early, Danny, if they take, say, I'm going to take it early, um, because sometimes I get, well, besides the break-even analysis, which I'm not a fan of, um, I get the, well, if I take it, they're not going to cut it. And I'm like, well, where does it say that? Well, but wait, wait, the break-even analysis doesn't change even if they cut it, because they're going to reduce your benefits from whatever amount you may take it at, right? Right, right. So... I, I do like the break-even analysis because it is good to know in the sense that, okay, what's your longevity look like? Are you likely to make it this long? And you can make better yeah, decisions. But people, I had a client yesterday who's doing a plan okay. who says, I don't like this Social Security claiming strategy you gave me because I'm going to live till 76 years old. Oh, <laughs> he knows his expiration date. Well, that's right? what I mean. I have a lot more people that tell yeah, me that. No, and, I I said, and I said, well, here's the bigger question. What if you don't? What if you live longer? What if your wife lives till 90? Right. Right? So, I, I mean, they're, they're tying the break-even date to the, the mortality tables and saying that's when they're going to go. I mean, they're so sure. And, and I have a lot of people that I talk to that tell me, oh, no, I'm dying at 77. I'm like, 78, I'm gone. Well, how do you know? Like, who's giving you this divine intervention that... Uh, did Janet Yellen come and tell you that? If Janet Yellen told you that you're going to live to 78, you're probably going to die tomorrow. Hey, but that's just like her job, right? Like, oh, look into this ball and these crystals. It's, the economy's just fine, Danny. Just, I think that's how she makes all decisions. Don't mess it up. Everything's good. Well, we'd all live differently if we knew our expiration date. Unfortunately, we don't. So we have to plan, you know, on both sides of this. Now, you do. If you're terminally ill, you have issues, you're single, you you're just need the income. You're not going to care because you're Take dead. It. Take you're it. not going to care because you're dead. But, but what if I live? Well, Terrible. but but it also the, goes back to the conversation we always have is yeah. that what if your spouse lives? Yes. And what if you live? Or they spouse? don't have the Social Security you have. Correct. Now it's a bigger problem. Now you've cut it for them, so your spouse is going to be cursing you for the rest of their lives. So easy way to die early. Yeah. You know another easy way to die early? Claim at 62 and not tell your low-earning spouse that you did it. There's a way to go. I've seen men especially do that. I don't know. Maybe I the, decided to take it. It's my benefit. Well, mm. maybe it's insurance. You're like, ah, well, can't get me now. Need me here. <laughs> That's how I get to stay alive. <laughs> we need those benefits. Uh, better invest in one of those blow up dolls. Oh, because you're not sleeping in this bed anymore. <laughs> Brent's oh, like, that's man. it. Show's over. Yeah, we've gone right, off, so. <laughs> way off track. And you know, Brent, I know where it started. First segment, Janet Yellen. I apologize, guys. 
Uh, you did open the door. Yeah, you're So I want to, there's an interesting story out there, Danny. And we sort of know this just by working with people. But a majority of U.S. parents have made financial sacrifices for their kids. Well, this we know. They're adult children. Nearly 7 in 10 parents, right, this is a recent study from Bankrate, with children 18 or older have made at least one financial sacrifice to help their kids. And which means that they're sacrificing another goal, possibly retirement. Right? And that's a, that's a big issue. That's a big issue. So dipped into their savings, one in five making significant sacrifices, nearly half have also put off paying down debt to provide support, and more than two in five parents reported helping at the expense of their retirement savings. Overall, 16% of parents reported significantly putting off hitting other financial milestones to prioritize their children's financial needs. Not surprising. No. Not surprising at all. And you have to keep in mind, I understand we want to help our kids. And there's ways to do it. But you're sacrificing your retirement savings to do it. That's a problem. Because no one's going to bail you out of retirement. There are some th things that they can do. So sometimes you got to have a heart. I mean, I hate to say it. I had one client that's really smart, like when he's been funding or helping his children through intrafamily loans with mortgages. He goes, but listen, there's two things you have to keep in mind, and I wrote an article based on this. One, I want their credit scores. What? Dad, you want my what? Yeah. What's your credit score? I need to know you're a good risk. Two, what's your skin in the game? What's your down payment going to be? In other words, he's acting like the bank of dad. He's not acting like a parent. And I think that's how you have to do it. Um, because if you're going to sacrifice your retirement for your children, listen, they're not going to sacrifice when you need it. Oh, well, they dad, may, they may have I'm... to if, if you've given them everything you have throughout your life. But the problem is you create that bad habit. Yes. And all of a sudden you're not there to bail them out. Now they don't have the funds either. So what's your what's both of your lifestyles like longer term? That begs the question. It does. It absolutely does. So, um, so on, Gen Z here's an interesting. Typically believes parents should fund expenses like bills and insurance to at least age twenty one. While baby boomers tend to believe children should be responsible for these types of expenses a full two years earlier. I think some skin in the game goes a long way. And so having them either hit some certain parameters, hey, you're in school, mm -hmm. you're working, you have good grades. Yep. I get helping while, while somebody's in college. But if they're out living on their own, they decided, hey, I'm not going to go to college. I'm not going to go to technical school. I'm not. I'm just going to go work. Okay. Well, you know, like for my daughter, I do pick up her cell phone bill and I pick up her uh, auto insurance. And I told her very clearly. Once you have a job, those stop. That's how it works. Um, you know, you got to, you have to have set, that's one of our financial guardrails is to set financial boundaries and stick to them. Would a stranger lend money to your children? Well, no, or that's your why brother. they're coming to you. Because <laughs> the bank won't give them money. Nobody else will give them money. Come on, man. Okay. They're That's... worth the risk. Don't worry. I know them. Yeah. Right. 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 Mm. I don't know. 27% received at least 25000 in financial help. Wow. Man. That doesn't include the financial boost from the generations living with their parents now, which is at the highest it's ever been since World War II. We get back. We got more rambling for this last segment. Stay tuned.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Retirement's not what it used to be. And knowing how health insurance works after you leave your job is vital. Our next Lunch and Learn will tackle transitioning to Medicare. Thursday, May 11th with Danny Ratliff and Richard Rosso. How will Medicare work with the insurance you already have? What are the deadlines you need to know for signing up for Medicare? Register now for our Transitioning to Medicare Lunch and Learn with Ratliff and Rosso at realinvestmentadvice.com. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. I think we're back. So our next Lunch and Learn, we had to do this way into the future, is going to be about transitioning to Medicare. Uh, It's going to be talking about how do you make these decisions on the alphabet soup of Medicare. And if you're employed or not, makes a big difference. So we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted. We had a really good turnout for our Social Security. A lot of great questions yesterday, Danny, on the Lunch and Learn. Went a little bit over, like 15 minutes or so. People were still engaged. Yeah, we could have kept going. It was, it was quite a bit, um, you know, which is great. You know, we always love to hear your feedback, love to answer your questions. If you do have questions, always go to realinvestmentadvice.com. Go to ask a question. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we know stuff comes up. Yes. And, it's difficult to kind of navigate it on your own. And so that's why we do these lunch and learns. And if there's topics that you've not seen us cover, you can always go to the real investment show on YouTube, go to subscribe. You'll see all of the past uh, webinars, lunch and learns uh, that we cover a lot of just really evergreen information. Obviously it does change year to year. So we do update that annually, but to your point, Rich, you know, we, we really enjoy getting the questions. And if there's topics we're not covering, yeah, that are important to you. We always want to know um, because, you know, as long as it's not, is the dollar going away? I'm t- <laughs> tired of answering that question. Yes. Um, no. If you want to, I will tell you not to make Michael's head bigger than it already is. Uh, Michael Leibowitz um, wrote really some, he's got a great piece out there about the dollar. You know, gives into all the mechanics. There's going to be a part two coming, uh, but there's a really good piece right now on real investment advice. If you want an education about your dream of a gold-backed currency is a dream that is not coming back, okay? It's just not. I know you all can talk about it. You all can romanticize about it. You will roll around and go, I love gold, but it's not going to happen. Well, but I think these are, the, the questions are relevant. Because we're getting the a lot of headlines. The question is relevant. We're getting a lot of headlines for, around this. Yes, and I think it's important for people to ask the question. But I'm, sometimes I give an answer that somebody doesn't want. Because the answer that's wanted is, yeah, yeah, it's going under and it's going to be gold and we're going to have a barter system. I mean, I don't know why, but I think 
when I start giving the answer that I'm going to give, it, it doesn't go over very well. Well, gold, number one, we got away from the gold standard. The economy is too large. You cannot use gold. You want to talk about oppression? Oh, geez. You want to talk about oppression? Yeah. The haves and the haves not, have and have nots? Go Way ahead on bigger. the gold standard. You know, um, The Wizard of Oz was written about the gold standard. That was the yellow brick road. There's, a, there's all kinds of meanings in The Wizard of Oz. There's a book out there called The Web of Debt. You should all read it. It was written about 12 years ago. Um, and it is one of the best books you've ever read on the fractional banking system and a lot of meaning behind the, behind the film that was economic. Uh, really interesting stuff. So to your point, Danny, um, you have to keep that in mind that it's just not. It would create more of a problem. Yeah, so stop romancing the gold, right? <laughs> yeah, it's okay to like be Scrooge McDuck and coddle it and shine it up and, oh, 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 you know, do what you want, put it in a nice black case. But it's just, it's not going to be what you envision it. And, and I don't think gold, gold's okay. So I'm also getting a lot of questions around, okay, well, we want to, we have gold. Well, how much gold do you have, right? Yeah, I think that's nothing big, wrong with it, right? Nothing wrong with holding no. gold. Now, from an investment standpoint, it doesn't pay any interest. If we look at it on an inflationary basis, it may not, it paints a much different picture than probably the charts that you see. Catalytic converter might be worth more than gold right now. Yeah. So store those. Well, I, I think it's, it, it, these are very interesting topics. Lots of questions around them because all these headlines, right? I mean, you're, you're looking right now, you know, big headline yesterday mm -hmm. uh, and, and throughout the last couple of weeks is Brazil and China, you know, ditching the dollar. We've seen this happen for years. Mm -hmm. And with, you know, technological advancements, um, I think as things develop, we're going to continue to see that where countries are going to determine saying, hey, we can trade with each other without using the dollar. But what are you going to store it in? Mm. Your reserves, what are you going to keep it in? You're going to keep it in something that fluctuates? No. Probably not. That's I mean, why your checking account right now, if your checking account fluctuates by 5%, yeah. that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So do you think these... Sovereign countries want that? Probably not. Now, in one way, being fiat currency is sort of uncomfortable because this is based on the faith and confidence that you have in your governing body. Well, and based on that... Everybody's losing faith. <laughs> these dollars should have Alfred E. Newman instead of George Washington. I mean, because it is like a Mad Magazine parody all over again. That's yeah, Mad, Mad Magazine really sort of gave birth to the Babylon Bee and others. And, and uh, Al Jaffe, who was one of the greatest illustrators, uh, I still have his books, Brent. I'm going to see. We can't talk to Danny about this because he wasn't even a sparkle. Um, but I still have like his snappy answers to stupid oh, questions. The books. guy was genius. He really was. Yeah. A uh, master illustrator, but funny. I mean, his stuff. And he, came, he was the one who created the fold-in covers mm -hmm. <laughs> for Mad Magazine. So, I mean, that guy, I think, worked his whole life doing that. I think he started in Just his... passed away last week. Yeah, or, last week, over yeah. like 100 years old. Yeah, yeah. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to work for Mad Magazine in the 60s. Now, there's <laughs> an idea for a sitcom. <laughs> A series. Right. If you can get the memoirs of what it was like. And there is a book yeah. actually about Mad Magazine. Um, it's rather thick. But yeah, it would be great. Just like it would have been great to see how they created like the um, Warner Brothers, the, the, the cartoons, Bugs Bunny, oh, Daffy Duck. Yeah. You know, you know, those guys had to be a bit loony, especially Daffy Duck was like some sort of homicidal. You ever see Daffy <laughs> Duck in the early days? He scared the hell. He, he would chase you around with an ax. Yeah. Parental and advisory. laugh while your head came off. I mean, <laughs> I, it, I mean, Daffy Duck had some problems. They had to tone him down. <laughs> and he's running around with this, with this ax. I'm like, how did we go from the dollar to here? <laughs> 
I don't know. It's pretty daffy. Yeah, it, it is. But but no, no if but you do have questions on that, go read yeah. Michael Leibowitz's article. It came out last yeah, what's earlier the, this week. On, the dollar's death, here. not so fast. Go to realinvestmentadvice.com. Yeah. Go to the blog. He's actually going to have part two coming out next week. Next week's part um, two. Lots of good information. I think that, you know, we have to take these things with a grain of salt. I think the problem we have right now is that if we we get an answer or we hear something that does not agree, it's not agreeable with our own thoughts. We just completely say, oh, nope. I want to read everything. I want to see, okay, what what am I not looking at? What I is, agree with you. you I know, want to read the contrary. I want to read like I don't believe we're going back on the gold standard, but I do want to read. Why we could. Why we could. I do want to read the opposing side. The problem we've had in society today is no one wants to step over the step over the line and look at each other's perspective. It's right away screaming and yelling and you're an idiot and where you do want to avoid the confirmation bias and try yeah. to look at the opposing view and go, okay, is there something in here I that I can learn? Now, if, there, if there's a real view with true information and not just emotional... Yeah, critical but, thinking. But I can tell you, every yeah. time I've actually visited with somebody with critical thinking on somebody that thinks differently than I do, I have always learned something. Me and too. I can always take something away from it. It's either they're really We've stupid... lost that ability, but yes, I agree. Or... Or, you know, hey, you got a good point. I'm kidding. Usually it's, it's yeah, you've got a really good point. But you're um, stupid. No, no, no. Oh, okay. I was just trying to be funny. I know. You may want to leave that to me. Yeah, maybe. Well, well I don't know. Well, I don't know. Based on some of the comments we get, maybe you should do it. Uh, that's not happening either. Uh, By the way, if you're watching this on the replay on YouTube... Uh, the link to uh, Michael Leibowitz's article is down below oh, in the good. description. Oh, good job, Brent. Yeah. Thank you. It's not, not right now because I haven't done it yet, but it will be when you watch this on replay. And I do have part two of Money Smart Kids, how to raise them. Uh, it's real important for you to be the teacher for your, ki for your children. You must teach financial literacy. Financial literacy in this country is beyond a disgrace. It has to start at the kitchen table. It has to start with you your examples, your conversations. So I give you some idea of how to do that in part two. Part three is coming up next month. That'll be the final with some really good activities and ideas for you. But we have to be or help our children to be financially literate. Um, it's so important. It, it is. And it starts really early. But Rich, don't you think going back to that, those surveys, that's why people are in such a problem now where mm -hmm. they're having to help their children because they never had these conversations earlier. And, and granted, there's going to be one-off situations, but I would think that if we did a better job of communication, yep. of being transparent, it would be much, much different when the kids are older. And Don't you see that with your clients that have, that have taught or have been open with money and communicating with their children from early on, that their children, even at, at in, in teen years, are even more financially responsible and then it goes into adulthood? Our, yeah. our most successful clients, I'm talking about yes. you know, very successful, they've always brought their children into the conversation. Correct. And they still do as adults, so they understand if something happens to them, yep. what they should do. But those kids are so much smarter now because of it. Yep. They could step right in, I, th I feel, most of the time and, and run the business or the family business or whatever what it may be. What a good feeling. What a good feeling. Yeah. I yeah. mean, great feeling. But I think everybody should do that, regardless of asset level, regardless of income. Have those conversations. My goal is that my kids are better than I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be everybody's goal. And they're not relying on me. Starts with you, though. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thanks for everybody's tuning in. We'll see you next week. Lance back on Monday. Have a great weekend. <laughs>